Hi, I'm Dr. Owen, and we're here to talk about a little bit of the music that's going to be on the Northwest Sinfonietta concert here at Pierce College, just talking about the composers and some little tidbits about the music. So we're going to talk about Mozart, about young Mozart. There's his full name you can see on this PowerPoint slide, although it's missing Amadeus that commonly uh, we see as well. Names are complicated. I'm not sure why and why we don't usually see the rest of that, but just for fun, there it is. Now, the interesting thing about Mozart, of course, everybody knows that Mozart was the great child prodigy. Um, and uh, it seems that even people that don't know much about music know that Mozart was this great child prodigy. But what's interesting is as you study other composers, there were a lot of composers who were incredible child prodigies, these genius children, um, but none of them get recognized for it the way that Mozart does. Why that is, I think, is in large part due to his father and the way that his father toured him about and displayed him, which is a little bit seen in this uh, video from a little clip from Amadeus the movie here was my idol Mozart I can't think of a time when I didn't know his name I was still playing childish games when he was playing music for kings and emperors even the Pope in Rome I admit I was jealous when I heard the tales they told about him. None of the brilliant little prodigy. So we see him playing the piano there, um, and he did violin and lots of other things on these tours through Europe. So in large part because of that, he became known all over Europe as this, you know, wonder child that could do these amazing things. So let's take a look at these actual tours that Father took him on. So between the years of 16, or sorry, 1762 and 1765 uh, was the first tour. Now that's a big span, and this is when he's six to about ten years old. Um, this is a, a massive tour for a, a child. Tour stops included, but aren't limited to Munich, where he plays in the Bavarian court, Vienna, where he plays for the Imperial court and several houses of nobility, Stuttgart, Mannheim, Brussels, Paris, London, and this is maybe a third of the list, uh, if not less. So a lot of stops all over Europe um, for a long time, massive tour. <coughs> On this, he's not only performing uh, and showing off what he can do as the, as the little prodigy, but he's also uh, hearing a lot of concerts, hearing what other composers are doing all over Europe, and he gets to meet some of them, including the, the, the son of Johann Sebastian Bach, Johann Christian Bach, who uh, meets with him, talks to him, and actually influences his first symphony compositions quite a bit. He's also doing some composing, even though he's, you know, under 10. He writes his first small operas, a mass, uh, lots of little piano pieces, things like this. So he's quite busy. Uh, and not only is he acclaimed as a pianist, but also as a violinist. He's doing things on the violin as well as composing. And a, a story, uh, since we're going to hear a violin concerto in a bit, uh, a story that kind of shows his ability at the piano that I heard once was fun. He. Uh, I'm assuming this is perhaps at home after that big first tour was done, but still a child. His father, uh, who was also a violinist, he was a musician, he was a violinist in the court of the Archbishop of Salzburg. He's having a rehearsal of a string quartet, so other members of this professional orchestra are here to play. And they decide to let little Mozart stand in and try it out. So uh, young Wolfgang is on the second violin playing the string quartet. A and before I know it, this quartet that they're rehearsing Little Mozart is correcting his father. Uh, he can only see his own second violin part, but somehow he can recognize that his father is missing notes. So as he's playing away, he's hollering to his father, that A, Dad, that's an A, no, that's an F sharp, <laughs> and fixing his father's mistakes on, uh, on the violin. So remarkable young man. Though uh, he didn't continue to perform the violin much as an adult, didn't care to do that. His father often tried to encourage him to, but, but uh, didn't seem to care for it. Well, back to his childhood, or continuing his childhood, I should say, there are three Italian tours that they take. You can see a list of some of the cities on there that he visits. They visit uh, music conservatories, um, or music schools and universities, and he's tested rigorously to see if he really can do all the things that uh, people claim he can do. Um, when it comes time for Holy Week, they happen to be in Rome, and they manage to have the opportunity to listen to the choir at the Sistine Chapel perform a piece that's very special to them by a composer named Allegri. It's titled Miserere, complex piece, multi-choir piece, a lot going on. And uh, they didn't let any other choir perform it. They didn't let anybody else have or see the music. 
And I'm not sure why, whether, I don't know if Mozart's father said, I'd love to see that music, or if Mozart just decided he wanted to. After listening to this uh, performance in the Holy Week service, he decided he'd write it down, just from that listening, from it's by ear. Um, it caused a bit of a stir. They, they thought, surely he must have snuck back uh, into the choir rehearsal rooms or something and stolen a score, and there's no way he could write that down. But after more of such rigorous tests and things, they decided, sure enough, he managed to do it. Um, the last of the Italian tours, uh, he's actually doing less performing as a prodigy and more having his music performed by the orchestras and things in the places he's visiting, and he's hoping for a job. Now, I realize we're still in the mid-teenage years here, but that's what they're hoping for. After that, uh, in 1773, a tour to Vienna as well. The same thing, he's hoping to find a permanent position. Uh, now, despite his remarkable gifts, his remarkable abilities, and his incredible compositions, even at age 17, no success, no job. Perhaps he was still thought of as being too young to hold that responsibility of a major position, or maybe it's just that everyone still thought of him as the child prodigy and that he would never be anything else. We see the same challenge, I think, for, for child actors today, that once they're, they're grown, often we still like to pigeonhole them as the child actor. Same thing, so he's perhaps still thought of as the child prodigy. Don't know, but for whatever reason, he doesn't manage to get a, a job at that point in Vienna. But the, t the waste, I mean, the, the trip is not a waste of time. It has an impact on how he composes, more things he's exposed to and, and uh, hears and learns and helps his composition. So what does he do? Heads back with the family to Salzburg. Um, there's a little postcard image of what Salzburg looked at the time and uh, he has a job in the orchestra there alongside of his father. Uh, Salzburg's a great place, but he certainly has future plans uh, for much bigger things. Uh, Salzburg is a very wealthy place, so that's great for supporting music, um, but at the same time, it's provincial. It's kind of a little out in the country. It's not like the big city Vienna where Mozart really wants to be. Uh, it's a good middle-class job in the court. In other words, the, the royalty is paying uh, for everything, so it's a nice, solid job. And in fact, Mozart uh, is the concert master. He's the head violinist in charge of things. And his job includes composing, and he continues to compose um, during those couple of years that he's there. So in 1775, while he's in that job, he's 19 years old, uh, the concert master in Salzburg, he writes five violin concertos. The first two aren't heard as much. The third really seems to be a turning point in his compositional style, even though these are all in the same year we see a little bit of a shift there uh, in the maturity of his music and, and in a growth in his own abilities. And so three, four, and five um, are at least a little more mature sound and heard more often. Three is perhaps the most popular, still heard today. And that's the one that's going to be on the Sinfonietta concert that we'll look at a little bit. So some of this is typical for any concerto of the day uh, for Mozart and anyone at this time. We're going to expect three movements. They're going to go fast, and then the second one will be slow and lyrical, and the last one will be fast again. The first one is in this sonata form, which uh, um, is a particular structure, but that's another lecture another day. Uh, and then the last one is also in a particular structure called a rondo form, and we'll take a look at that. So the first movement, um, I read one scholar that was saying that uh, he felt that the uh, motives were all musical laughter, different varieties of musical laughter. And whether you feel that way or not, we certainly see, and you can see on the slide some excerpts of the music, but even if you don't read music, you can see the kind of shaking back and forth. Uh, two notes there, and then on the second example, there's this kind of little repeated notes with the dots over them, this kind of uh, short, 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 little bouncing sort of figures that certainly have uh, an amount of jovialness to them uh, that I can see why he would think that. Let's hear a little bit of this concerto, first movement. <laughs>
that light uh, character of the of that first movement. Now, the other thing to expect in there is a cadenza, and this is typical for all concertos again of the day, and this is a moment where the orchestra stops, and it's a soloist's time. And we're not sure if Mozart wrote this concerto for himself to perform in Salzburg, or uh, the kind of another prominent violinist who was there, but we do know that he did perform it at some other times because of some letters that he wrote to his father about it. Um, and this cadenza, in Mozart's time, what it would be is the orchestra stops and the solos would improvise. And so that would be one of the things that people would love to see is what Mozart makes up on the spot in his concerto or what some other performer makes up on the spot in the middle of Mozart's concerto. Uh, these days, uh, performers tend to, to study and practice one that's been, been written out. But uh, that cadenza you'll hear tends to be showy. The violinist gets to do some impressive things while the orchestra waits. And the orchestra will come back in and it tends to be right before the end. And we'll have the end. Second movement. Uh, famous Mozart scholar Alfred Einstein, not Albert, but Alfred Einstein, uh, referring to the second movement, said that it was dropped straight from heaven. Um, beautiful, gorgeous piece, slow and lyrical as is typical of the second movement, uh, and kind of this idea of imitation of a beautiful opera aria, a beautiful song, shows Mozart's gift for lyricism. <laughs> So very similar to a melody that we might get in a Mozart opera, soprano, love aria sort of thing. Now the third movement <coughs> is in a rondo form, slightly modified, and that's why you see a couple of different spellings. Sometimes those are associated with different modifications. But anyway, the rondo form went, we have music that we'll call A, for lack of anything else, just to label a chunk of music we'll call A, a main theme, sometimes called the rondo theme. And then there'll be something contrasting, B. And then that A is always going to come back and then there'll be something contrasting again, and then the A will come back. And so that's really the only principle is that this A comes back. The rest of it's somewhat flexible. You could have A, then B, then s A, and then C, and then A, then B, meaning something new every time, or the contrasting stuff could come back too. You could have A, then B, then A, then C, then A, and then B comes back again. It doesn't really matter. It's just as long as there's that rondo main theme that keeps returning. Now, in this third movement of the Third Violin Concerto, Mozart uses a tune as one of those contrasting, one of those other letters um, that he had heard in the, the city of Strasbourg. And uh, he weaves that tune in there uh, and uses that in that concerto. In fact, a letter to his father at some point discussing his performing of it on a tour somewhere, he says that he uh, played the Strasbourg Concerto and kind of refers to this concerto titling it after that little tune. You don't see the tune as that uh, title associated with it very often today, but uh, he does that. Let's hear a little bit of this rondo. I think that's the second movement. So I have to expect from the last movement, something light and bouncy. Enjoy listening to more of that. Thank you for watching and enjoy the music.